This is Yair Davidi from Brit Am, Movement of the Ten Tribes of Israel, speaking to you from Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, of the state of Israel. We are now continuing a discussion that proves that the British are descended, or at least to a great degree, derived from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim was the sub-tribe of Joseph. Joseph was divided into two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim was the younger son, but he was destined to receive the greater blessing, and we have identified the USA as Manasseh in separate talks. And at present we are now proving in a series of talks that Ephraim is to be found amongst the British and offshoots of the offshoots of the British such as Australia, New Zealand, Canada and related nations. We now reach the point concerning a blessing to Ephraim that was fulfilled in the British Empire much more than it was fulfilled by the USA. And uh, this too is a proof that Ephraim is Britain. Uh, when uh, Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph, Jacob it was also known as Israel, he was the forefather of the Israelite tribes. And he gave a blessing to the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. He gave a specific blessing to Ephraim. He said, and his father refused, he refused to, to, uh, to take his hand off the head of Ephraim. Jacob had preferred or was laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim even though Ephraim was the younger son, and this laying of his right hand, crossing his hands and laying his right hand on the head of Ephraim showed a certain degree of preference. And this did not find favor in the eyes of Joseph, who was the father of the boys. He tried to take the hand of Jacob off the head of Ephraim and put on the head of Manasseh, but Jacob refused. His father refused and said, I know it, I know my son, I know who is the first one and who is not biologically, but he also shall be a people. He also, in other words, Manasseh shall also become a, a people, but at a later date. And he also shall be great. Manasseh too shall be great, but once again at a later date, at a later time. But truly his younger brother, meaning Ephraim, his younger brother Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. A multitude of nations is how it is translated in most English versions. Actually, in Hebrew, the Hebrew words are Melo Agoyim. Melo Agoyim, literally um, the fullness of the nations. And this has uh, several uh, different explanations. And explanations do not contradict each other, they rather complement each other, they round each other out, they, give, they present different aspects of the same truth. Onculus, who was uh, rendered the Bible into Aramaic, but uh, his uh, translation is more of um, a paraphrase, a commentary, as much a commentary as, as a direct translation. So he translated uh, Malah Goim in Hebrew as uh, a ruling over other nations. Ibn Ezra, a great commentator once more, who is also a great commentator, Ibn Ezra said it means that many nations would emerge from him. We, according to the simple meaning of the Hebrew, understand it to mean, in the light of these and other explanations, that Manah means fullness of the nations, that he would bring um, the peoples of the world. The nations in Hebrew can also connect all of the nations, the Gentile nations. He would enable them to become nations of fullness. He would, make their com he would complete them. And uh, many nations in the world, and numerous nations, have their existence thanks to the British Empire. The British created them. The British found them as wild tribes. I'm not being prejudiced or racialist or anything. This is an historical truth. You can look it up on the internet. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Many nations, for instance, India, India, the Indians are quite civilized people. They don't highly develop a civilization. Even so, at that time when the British came, they were divided into numerous nations. They were killing each other, wiping each other out. They were practicing human sacrifice. And the Sati, incidentally, they were, since the British left, they returned to these practices in some degree. And uh, they were uh, suffering from all kinds of um, problems that the British uh, solved for them and helped them, united them, and, uh, re and gave them irrigation and health, and uh, helped them, uh, helped them recover. 
and help them uh, set themselves up and so that they, their numbers greatly increased and then not only did their numbers greatly increase but those who lived, the new, the new the additional people lived, they did not suffer from a diminishing of living standards which are on the contrary the living standards also went up. So did the uh, respect for, for human dignity, human lives and uh, the standard of living in general. And this uh, happened throughout the British Empire. The British Empire was a force for good and uh, not only in India but in other places throughout the world, one quarter of the world's population was ruled over by the British and uh, one uh, quarter or more than a quarter of the world's area also was ruled over, uh, the, the, uh, was also encompassed by the British Empire. The British Empire created these peoples. It was not a case of uh, them being independent and being ruled, or being ruled over by the British, it was a uh, choice historical choice at that time under the conditions of the time was to be ruled over by the British or to be ruled over by someone else and relatively speaking the British were much more benign, they were much more uh, genteel, they were more civilized, they were more humane on a comparative level than other nations on the whole with exceptions, there were exceptions and we'll also speak about the exceptions at all events to rule over other peoples, to uh, enable other peoples to come into existence, to reach their own fulfillment that was fulfilled by the British. The British did that, they did that more than any other nation in the world. And therefore the British on this point alone fulfilled the specific blessing given to Ephraim and this was the blessing that Jacob emphasized and that Jacob used it to distinguish from Manasseh. This is the distinguishing point. The, the, uh, the USA also ruled over other nations, they ruled over the Philippines, they ruled over Puerto Rico, they ruled over uh, different places here and there. And they still rule over small islands and different, uh, different um, forts and strategic areas and uh, indirectly they have a ruling say in a great many nations throughout the world but they are not, uh, they do not have the hands on aspect of uh, directly ruling other peoples and uh, creating peoples and bringing them into being and they at least they do not have to the same degree that the British have uh, and no nation in the world has it. The British Empire was the greatest empire that ever lived in terms of extent, in terms of progress and in terms of uh, statistical st success. In terms of the standard of living that it gave to, to, to most of its inhabitants and the degree to which it elevated the living aspects of existence of the peoples under its rule. And we have written on this and other people have written on this and it is uh, this is undeniable. This is a point, this is a truth, this is a factor proving that the British are a prime. The British and British offshoots such as Australia, New Zealand and Canada and other places. We will uh, give you a few points now concerning the British Empire, just uh, very roughly, very briefly uh, give you a little bit of uh, background information because it's interesting and it is pertinent to what we are talking about. From the, first of all, you, have, uh, you had uh, England, you had the, the country called England. England was conquered from, by, from the Romans by the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes who also subjugated the local native Britons and uh, they created the country of England. This uh, England was a country in the Middle Ages and England um, later on uh, conquered or attempted to conquer Wales and Cornwall and Scotland and Ireland and rule over them. They also uh, ruled over parts of France, Normandy and Brittany and attempted to conquer all of France although they did not succeed but all, uh, at all events the Britain did even at this time have um, what may be called imperial ambitions. In the 1600s, the British took uh, people from their borderland areas in the north and from lowland Scotland and settled them in what is now Ulster and what is now Northern Ireland. And from the, the, these peoples who settled there and also the native inhabitants, the merchants, Scotch-Irish, the so-called Scotch-Irish, who later, to a good degree, migrated to the USA and uh, contributed greatly to the American uh, being. To the American, uh, most uh, presidents of the USA are descended from these people, from the Scotch-Irish. All events are concerning the the, uh, the coming into being of the, of the English Empire, of the British Empire, 
We had the Tudor monarchs from Wales, and they, in effect, gave rise to uh, modern England, and the Tudor Rose, which is a symbol of Israel, was introduced by the Tudor monarchs. Henry VII, the first Tudor monarch, encouraged John Cabot to uh, explore the waters of North America. Uh, this was in 1497, just uh, Shortly before then, in 1492, Christopher Columbus had discovered America. Also, the Jews had been expelled from Spain in the same year. And uh, somehow there's a connection between the Jews uh, being uh, thrown out of this place and the, 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 uh, the uh, New World being opened up. After Christopher Columbus discovered uh, the America, the Spanish and the Portuguese empires uh, divided, began to divide what was then known as the New World between them. They then... Uh, they then uh, broke out into hostilities between uh, Spain and Britain. Elizabeth I, the daughter of, Hen of Henry VIII, Elizabeth I over England, she encouraged English pirates and buccaneers and sailors and gentlemen to attack at Spanish ships and Spanish colonies. And this was one of the uh, first, um, the first uh, aspects of English imperial overseas ambitions being exhibited in, on a, in the modern sense. One of the advisors of Elizabeth was named John Dee, who was also an, an astronomer and he was an expert in navigation. He trained English navigators and he also wrote books and he was quite, um, quite a wise person. And he uh, had the, the, he was the first person to coin the phrase, the phrase in the British Empire and he um, foresaw the, the coming into being of a British Empire and he gave uh, what may be considered an ideological basis for the idea of British imperialism. After that, the British uh, established colonies, established colonies in the 1600s, late 1600s in North America. There was, the, the, uh, there was also the uh, attempt by the Scottish Parliament to uh, establish a, an empire of its own. Under James I, the thrones of Britain and Scotland had been united. The King of Scotland became the King of England and together they ruled over the United Kingdom. But even though the King was, or the King of both countries was one and the same person, they had separate governments and separate, and separate governmental entities that were somewhat independent of each other. The Scottish attempted to establish uh, a colony of their own in what is now Panama and they failed. Uh, they invested a great deal of money in this enterprise and when it failed they were in danger of uh, total bankruptcy and uh, as a result of this they established or they agreed to the Acts of Union with England in which the two governments, the government of Scotland and England would come together and one of the motivating factors in this unification of Scotland and England or the, the cementing of the Union as if to say was the Scottish uh, real, realization that uh, Scotland could never be a major power on its own and that if it wanted to share in the benefits of international trade and international imperialism it had to do so through the Ages or through the agency of England and as part of one country, of one ent polity. And the Welsh too, the Welsh had always in their legends and their writings and dreamed, they had dreamed of having a world world empire. The world's it's a small country and uh, serious thinkers in Wales realised that they, this dream could never be realised on its own. They were not, not capable of doing it, but they could do it through the English and anyway the English had conquered them. They were part of England. The, the ruling uh, house of England, the Tudor monarchs, came from Wales, at least in part. So this uh, imperialist ambition or imperialist tendency, so to say, uh, intensified the unification of different parts of the British, of, of, of what later became Great Britain, of, a, of, of, the, of a unification of Britain in its rule over the British Isles. Later we had the British East India Company which had established trade in India and through a series of wars and enterprises, uh, private enterprises, they conquered India. Uh, Meanwhile, the American colonies had grown and developed and become uh, independently minded until they rebelled and had the War of Independence in 1776 and after that many 
a loyalist in North America in what was then the USA who still wanted to remain loyal to Britain. They moved to Canada. In 1770, Captain James Cook explored the east coast of Australia. And shortly afterwards, a colony, a penal colony was established in Australia and uh, they founded uh, the Australian climate, the Australian environment was good for sheep growing. And so they introduced the merino sheep from Spain and very quickly Australia became the leading producer of wool, a wool, the leading producer of wool, of wool in the world. And as far as I know it still is. Uh, after that, uh, gold was, uh, was found in Australia and uh, people came to Australia from all over the world. And uh, well, this was uh, in the 1850s and around the same time in New Zealand was settled by people from Britain and they fought wars against the Maoris, the local Polynesian natives, and uh, eventually reached a, kind of a settlement with them and they were unable to, uh, to, uh, to establish what a very um, a very uh, respected settlement in the, the islands of New Zealand. And uh, the British Empire continued to grow. They had wars against Napoleon, and the wars against the French, against the Spanish, and uh, they had acquired all different territories and so on that these uh, other nations had acquired before them. Uh, princes are received in Malta, which uh, later would become very important in the Mediterranean, was very important in the Second and Second World War. They received the West Indies, they received Ceylon, they received places in, uh, in South America and Indonesia, but later gave them back, or relinquished control of them. And so the British Empire developed. In 1833, the, the slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire, and shortly afterwards Britain took upon it the task of abolishing, of uh, working for the elimination of slavery, or at least international slavery, everywhere. And so, uh, so uh, Britain asserted its control over the seas. It's right to search any ship and to stop slavery wherever it took place. And uh, this, uh, these actions, this policy, established or um, confirmed what was known as the Pax Britannica, the rulership of Britain, the peace of Britain, and the British, British control of and influence in over a good portion of the globe. They also in South Africa established settlements and, and they found gold there and uh, diamonds and uh, British settlers came there but there had been Dutch, a mixture of Dutch, German and French Huguenot settlers and there before them known as Boers and uh, they fought a war with them and uh, eventually they, um, they too conquered, the British took control of all of South Africa and later it became Rhodesia and parts of Eastern Africa, North East Africa in 1975, Benjamin Disraeli, a Jewish Prime Minister of Britain, of England, he acquired on his own initiative the Suez Canal and also the island of Cyprus. And this gave Britain a very important uh, strategic thoroughfares and uh, leeway and access to the east. And, uh, and this was a policy, uh, an ongoing pattern that the British Empire established of uh, acquiring strategic areas or strategic ports or passes pathways and so on, and straight passageways in the sea. This was uh, an aspect of British imperial policy and this too is uh, one of the proofs that the British were descended from the tribes of Israel. And, but America also, even today, America continues this policy. That is another point. It, it does prove that the, the, both the Americans and the Israelis, the Americans are Israelites, as are the British. At least uh, the, most of the Lost Ten Tribes are amongst them and they do fulfill the, the blessings given unto the Lost Ten Tribes. Now we are concentrating upon the, uh, the British Imperialism as it reflects the blessing given to, to Ephraim. The Tsarayim Malay Hagoim, his seed will be full of the nations, would be the fullness of the nations would be through him. He would give a rise to other countries and rule over other countries and that is what he did. We should. Uh, also mentioned that this acquisition of one quarter of the globe and of these um, hundreds of millions of peoples was not always uh, done uh, but with, uh, through the government policy. Sometimes the government was against it, but that uh, was being pushed into doing so, into acquiescing in this acqu acquisition of new colonies, colonies, new territories through circumstance or through um, the initiative of individuals who were going against government policy. The British government didn't often were um, very conservative characters or liberal-minded characters. They were not enthusiastic about taking new peoples under their control or taking responsibility for them or having to put out money and trouble and expense on, on them, on their behalf, and also of uh, possibly endangering, 
endangering their relationships with neighbouring peoples and getting into wars that they were not prepared for or would regard as superfluous and, and, uh, and dangerous and, and um, too adventurous for respectable people. But nevertheless, this is what happened. Uh, J.R. Seeley, a famous great historian, he said that the British acquired the empire. He said, uh, we, this, these are his words, we seem as it were to have conquered and peopled half the world in a fit of absence of mind. In other words, they weren't even conscious of what they were doing now. It was as if they were fulfilling an unwritten destiny that had been foretold that they would Fulfill, and this was part of what they had to do as being a fine as being from the seed of Joseph. We must, we should also mention a few negative points about the British Empire. On the whole, the British Empire was positive, it was overwhelmingly positive, it was a positive influence in world history. But there were a few negative points, we'll go quickly through them. Because uh, don't worry, other people have a uh, well, you'll find a lot of people say today who will stress these negative points much better than I can and much more uh, thoroughly than we will do. The, one of the negative points was in Ireland. With the British ruled over Ireland. They tried to make the Irishmen into, Brit into Britons, into British people, but they didn't go all the way. That may have been a mistake. They uh, did and they didn't. These half measures may have been a mistake. They. Um, they uh, caused suffering to the Irish, they tried to change Irish culture, to, they were prejudiced against the Irish culture and Irish tra uh, traditions and language. And then in 1845 to 1852 we had what was known as the Great Famine when the potato, the potato harvest failed. And millions of people, or uh, millions or a million and a half, or uh, there's a debate uh, concerning the exact numbers, a great number of people, a, a significant proportion of the uh, of the total population, possibly as much as 25% of the population of Ireland died of starvation. And millions, other, a million, and many, many more millions went to North America, went to Canada, went to different areas of the world, and also went to Australia because of this. And the British handling of this crisis mean, meant, mean, left much to be desired, even by the lackadaisical, haphazard uh, standards of that period. Uh, also in South Africa, the British fought against the war, against the Boers, the Dutch and uh, the Dutch and Germanic settlers were there before them. They fought wars with them, and whether or not the wars were justified is another thing. But uh, they were the Boers, the people who were fighting against the tough fighters. They were experts in guerrilla war warfare, and they would also, would, in order, and they would also um, attack and then go and hide in their homesteads and in order to deny them this basis of support the British uh, put, put, put together a group, great number of their women and children and put them in what is later known as concentration camps and in these camps they, they, the, the people suffered from, uh, from, the, from uh, the conditions bad conditions, extremely bad conditions and from the spread of um, malnutrition and uh, endemic contagious diseases such as measles, type and dysentery and uh, 26,000 of them died. And this is another uh, black point, another bad point against the British Empire. Uh, even though, even so, the, many of the South Africans say they made peace and we were reconciled with British rule. And some of the strongest, the strongest supporters of the British Empire, such as General Smuts, who fought against the British at that time, and later he became one of the strongest supporters and, and uh, advocates of the British imperialism. So it's not a black and white story. We also had the Chinese Opium Wars in 1839, 1842, 1856, 1860, in which there were disagreements with China over trade privileges, over the rights of foreigners, over all kinds of issues. Also the British merchants were strongly involved in the opium, in the, in the trade in opium. Opium is, is a drug. Heroin is derived from opium. The Chinese nationally did not want their people getting too hooked on opium. So they tried to um, to forbid the trade or at least regulate it to con and control it. The British fought wars with them and in the end they, as a result of these wars, they did receive concessions from the Chinese and they did have also hand over control of the opium trade to the Chinese. But nevertheless, the foot 
the, the fact that they were involved in the trade and that they fought a war, or two wars actually, over on this point, also is uh, morally, uh, is not, is not morally acceptable. At least, even by, even by the standards of, of relatively, of historical relativism. Even by those standards, it is not acceptable. Also, we have the, in, in Palestine, the British received the mandate over Palestine after the, after the First World War. They ruled over Palestine, the, the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations, gave the British control over Palestine and they wrote, it was written that the British should uh, encourage or support the establishment of a Jewish homeland in what was then Palestine. When the British did do so, they did help the, the Jews, they helped the Jews set up their country, they established the infrastructure, the basis for numerous settlements, and uh, they helped the Jews uh, build up the land and uh, rehabilitate the land and establish uh, the, the, the education facilities and the economic basis and uh, they gave them protection and economic support and so on. But nevertheless, here and there, amongst the British in Palestine, there were anti-Jewish elements, also in, in the British government circles of anti-Jewish elements. The policies of the British governments were changed from here, from, the, from time to time. And there were aspects of this rulership that were negative, that were against the Jews even though on the whole they were not. And this is a, this can be debatable and it's a complicated issue. We have studied the issue, we have come to the conclusion, not only we, we have adopted the conclusions of others that said that on the whole the British record concerning the Jews was extremely positive and that the, Jew, the Jews have the British to thank to some degree, to maybe possibly to a very large de degree to for the present day existence of the State of Israel and despite despite certain aspects or certain changes of policy or certain um, uh, uh, deeds and expressions of negative opinion by British officials at specific times. Uh, this is a point for a longer talk, but uh, we, we should mention that as well. So on the whole, the British Empire was a positive thing. The British Empire gave rise to the United States, it gave rise to Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, it gave rise to a host of smaller nations and uh, it established principles of liberty and democracy. Even when the British Empire came, when the time came time for the British Empire to dis desolate, to, to, uh, to be finished, to end its, its period of rulership, relatively speaking, compared to the French, compared to other peoples that did this well, they did this with finesse, with a minimum of disturbances on the whole, it was done quite quietly and successfully. The transition from subju subjuge subjection to independence by the peoples who the British ruled over was a smooth transition on the whole, especially compared to the experience of other, other peoples and other nations. Uh, when the last British Empire existed, it was a, a free trade area it led to the export of capital, of the building of roads, railways and industries all over the earth. Not only in the, in, within the confines of the British Empire, but also in numerous areas around, around the, on, the, on the periphery of the British Empire, where the British uh, um, investment was strong and the British influence made itself felt. They brought government order to places that had beforehand had neither one or the other. The British officials on the whole were fair, they were just. Uh, by the sense of that time and they uh, elevated the natives, they brought light to the Gentiles, this is what they did, well like it or not, the imperialism now has a bad name to it, there might be very a lot of nasty aspects to it, a lot of uh, very negative associations with it, but on the whole they did bring light to the Gentiles and they did help people, and they did establish people who were an improvement of what had existed beforehand. The English common law was also used and it was valued, the English language helped unite peoples. Uh, the British ab abolished slavery and they stamped it out wherever possible. They brought law and order, invention, medicine, and justice systems to many parts of the world. And uh, they were the, the, mo the most powerful economic entity in the world. No other major economy has ever held such a large proportion of its assets overseas. More British capital was invested in the Americas than in Britain itself between 1865 and 1914. That's what the historian Niall Ferguson tells us. 
Niall Ferguson also tells us that free trade with the developing world suited Britain, with a huge earnings from overseas investment, not forgetting other invisible such as insurance and shipping, she could afford to import vastly more than she exports. And moreover, the terms of trade, the relationship between export and import prices moved by around 10% and so on. In other words, the Britain benefited from it and helped establish the British standard of living, the elevated standard of living of the British people, to help the British working class and to raise themselves up. It also helped the peoples who were providing the services or receiving them, who were providing them.